So if you'll take out your message notes inside your program, we're continuing in our uh, series on the manifestation of your life mission. God has a mission for every life. God doesn't create anything without a purpose. And, and just as every plant, every rock, every animal has a purpose, if you're breathing, God has a purpose for your life. It's called your life mission. You weren't put on this planet to live for yourself. No, no, no. You have a far bigger purpose in life than simply to make money, retire, and die. You weren't put on this planet to take up space, to breathe, to use resources, and die. God has a plan and a purpose. He has a life mission for your life. Now, in this series, we're using the life of a prophet in the Bible called Jonah. Small book, only four chapters. Uh, and, and actually, Jonah did the wrong thing. He ran from his life mission for much of, of uh, his story. But he finally gets it right in the end. So we learn from both the right things he did, but we also learn from the wrong things that he did. Now, uh, on the screen, as we looked at each chapter, and this is uh, chapter three uh, in this session, chapter one, we looked at Jonah rebelling and running from God and his mission. If you missed that message, we talk about 10 truths you need to know about your life mission that we learn from the life of Jonah. And when you run from your life mission, it always causes problems, it causes storms for other people. Then in Jonah chapter two, we see Jonah repenting and returning to God and his mission. <clears throat> and that's where he prays. He's swallowed by this large fish that God had made, taken to the bottom of the ocean. And in the bottom of the ocean, he, he, he cries out to God. And we talked about what to do when, you, when life feels hopeless, when you've hit bottom. <clears throat> now, we come to chapter three. And in Jonah chapter three, we see Jonah restarting <clears throat> and running with God on mission. And so now we're gonna look at what happens when you get a second chance. Now, we ended the last chapter where this giant fish that God had custom made for uh, Jonah spits him up back out on the ocean, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, uh, beach. And Jonah chapter three, verse one, starts with one of the most important verses in the Bible. And it says this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Circle that, a second time. God is the God of second chances. God loves to give us <clears throat> second chances, third chances, fourth chances. He gives us many, many chances because of his grace and his mercy. Now, after Jonah's rebellion, if you've been with me the first two weeks uh, on, on this message series, uh, does Jonah deserve to get another chance? No way. If you were God, would you give Jonah another chance? Probably not, but God, loves to give second chances. God delights in showing grace. God delights in showing mercy. In fact, I made a short list of people who God gave another chance. I could have spent this entire message just sharing with you the names of people in the Bible that God gave a second chance to. But let me just show you a representative short list of you think, well, God would never give me a second chance. Well, let me show you what he did do. Jacob cheated on his brother, cheated out of his, cheated his brother out of his family inheritance. God gave Jacob a second chance. Moses murdered a man. God gave Moses a second chance. Rahab was a prostitute. She gets a second chance and ends up being in the family tree of Jesus. God uses her. Samson wasted his talent and ended up in prison. God give him, gave him a second chance. David committed adultery and had the husband of the woman he had an affair with murdered. God gives him a second chance. Peter denies Jesus Christ at his arrest right before the crucifixion. He's been with Jesus three and a half years when they say, don't you know this guy? He goes, I don't even know the guy. Totally denies Jesus. Cops out at the last second. Uh, and then Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a hated, dishonest businessman. Nobody liked Zacchaeus. And yet Jesus gave him a second chance. Now, God gives everybody chances over and over and over and over. And that's what I want us to look at, what to do when you get a second chance from God. You know, I, I wanna start with a true confession. I hate golf. 
okay? I really don't like it at all. I don't like it for two reasons. One, it takes too long. I don't have time to go spend hours and hours uh, on that. And second, and more important is, you can play it your entire life and never get any better at it. <laughs> uh, that is so frustrating that you play it and play it and play it and you still just don't get any better. Uh, but my brother loved golf and when my brother was alive, I loved to play golf with my brother because it was so much fun, it gave me a chance to be with him. The one thing I do love about golf was a term that I learned in playing golf and it's called a mulligan. Now, if you don't know what a mulligan is, a, a mulligan is when you, you get another shot because you've made a poor one. And, and, and you take a stroke and it, the, the, the ball sucked, it was just terrible. And so you get a do-over and it's not counted on your scorecard. I love this idea. It's called a mulligan. We ought to live in the mulligans of God. The grace of God. When he gives us a chance to do over, to start over, to try again, to give it our best shot, and, and he just shows us mercy. He shows us grace. He's forgiving over and over and over and over and over. And you say, well, that's not fair. It's not counted in your scorecard. Of course it's not fair. It's called grace. It's called mercy. Now, the mulligan verse of the Bible is in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. And that verse says this. A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets what? Another chance, circle that. He gets another chance. He gets a mulligan. This is amazing grace of God that anybody who refuses to admit his mistakes, you're never gonna be successful. But if you confess and forsake them, you get another chance. Another mulligan verse in the Bible is the next verse on your outline, Lamentations chapter three. And in chapter three, verse 22 and 23 of Lamentations, it says this. The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. In other words, God's never gonna stop loving you. You can't make God stop loving you because his love is based on who he is, not what you do. The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. It is his mercy that has kept us from complete destruction. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for his mercy. His faithfulness is great and his mercies begin afresh, read it with me, every new day. His mercies are new every new day. Now I want you to write this down. Every new day is another chance from God. You need to start looking at your life as every new day is another chance from God. God is giving you a second chance a 100th chance, a 1 millionth chance. Every new day, he's giving you another opportunity. So then the big question is, if every day of my life is really another chance, it's fresh start, his mercies are new every morning, he's not gonna run out of mercy, then what should I do when God gives me another chance? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> because in chapter three of Jonah, Jonah does five things. When Jonah finally gets another chance, he gets a mulligan, he does five things. These are the five things you need to do when God gives you a second chance, which is every new morning of your life. He gives you a second chance. He gives us five specific things to do. All right, so let's get right into it. Number one. When God gives me another chance, the first thing I need to do is this, live with profound gratitude. I need to live with profound gratitude. I need to wake up every day saying, thank you God, thank you that my heart is still beating, there's blood still pulsing through my veins, I'm breathing, I can see, I can hear, I can eat, I'm alive. Thank you God, you have given me another chance. You've given me another opportunity. You've given me another moment of mercy and grace. Your mercies do every morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You live with a profound sense, not of duty, 
but of gratitude, of gratefulness, of, of thanksgiving. Uh, I'll never forget, probably 40 years ago, I, I said something to a guy, I said, how you doing? And usually what people respond to that, I don't even remember because it's meaningless, so I'm doing fine or whatever. But I asked this guy, and I've never forgot it in about 40 years, I said, how you doing? He said, better than I deserve to be doing. And I thought, wow, couldn't we all say that one? Better than I deserve to be doing because it's all grace. If I got what I deserved, I wouldn't be here. Neither would you. It's all the grace of God. It's all a gift of God. Everything I have is a gift from God. You say, well, I work for it. Where'd you get the ability to work? Where'd you get your mind? Where'd you get your body? Where'd you get your freedom? Where'd you get your brain? Everything you have is a gift from God. And, and it's all because of his grace. I didn't work for it. I didn't earn it. It's because I'm doing better than I deserve to be doing. So the first thing you wanna do, when you get a second chance, and, and you know, you've gone through the bankruptcy, or you've gone through the divorce, or you've gone through the cancer, or you've gone through the scandal, or you've gone through the mess, or you've gone through the depression, or you've gone through 100,000 different problems, you got another chance. God gave you another chance. What do you do? The first thing you do is you start living with a profound sense of gratitude to God for his goodness, for his grace. And you demonstrate how you are thankful to God for giving you another chance. Now Jonah does this. In fact, he did it even before he gets out of the, the belly of that great fish. While he's in the deep, deep part of the ocean, we looked at this in our last session, in Jonah chapter two, nine and 10, the last verses we looked at in our last session, Jonah told God, he's still in the middle of the problem, I will sing my thanksgiving to you, and I will sacrifice to you, and I'll do what I've promised you to do. Why? Because salvation comes from you, Lord. Then God ordered the fish to spit up Jonah onto the beach, and it did. Now, in that verse, again, we covered this before, but I wanna reinforce it. Three ways you express deep gratitude to God. Write these down, three ways. Number one, I sing my thanks to God. That's the first thing Jonah says, because I'm gonna sing my thanksgiving to you. Singing is a spiritual act of being grateful to God. You don't have to be on key, you don't have to have the right note, you just make a joyful noise. It, Psalm 92 verses one and two says, it's good to say thank you to the Lord. It's good to say thank you to the Lord and to sing praises to him. Every morning tell him, thank you for your kindness. So every morning you get up and you start singing, the hills are alive. No, no, you just say, thank you God, thank you. Really cool day, glad, glad to be alive. My pulse is still going, thank you. I am profoundly grateful for another chance, another opportunity, another day. I sing my thanks to God. Number two, I give my offering in thanks to God. I realize that everything I have comes from God and I give part of it back to him as a symbol of gratitude going, I realize it all comes from you. You, you don't really own anything. Uh, it, it wasn't yours before you were born. It's not gonna be yours after you die. You only get to use it. God owns everything in the world. He loans it to you for about an 80 year period. What you think you own is really on loan. You're just a steward. You're a manager. You don't really own anything because you didn't own it before you were born. You're not gonna own it after you die. You're not taking it to heaven. So it's all God's but he loans it to you and, 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 and the Bible says that we give part of it back to him, it's called tithing, as a result to say, God, I just recognize it all comes from you. I wouldn't have any of this if it weren't for you. Now the Bible says in Psalm 50, verse 23, God says, the people who honor me are those who bring me an offering. Why? To show thanks. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need my money. God owns it all. So what does he want? He just wants your thanks. He just wants your gratitude. He wants to demonstrate, a gift is a demonstration of, of gratitude. It says the people who honor me are those who bring me an offering to show thanks, and I save those who obey me. So I sing my thanks to God, and I give my offering in thanks to God. And the third thing I do is I commit my life to God's mission for me. 
I commit my life to God's mission for me. When, when God gives you another chance, he doesn't want you to just go out and keep using it to live for yourself. He wants you to use it for his purpose. Romans chapter six, verse 13 says this. Give yourselves completely to God, every part of you, for you are back from death and you wanna be tools in the hands of God to be used for his good purposes. So that's the first thing you wanna do when you've been given a second chance from God. You tell God how grateful you are. God, I'm alive. I made it through that crisis, that scandal, that problem, that sin, that relational hell, and I'm still here. And, and you've given me another chance. And I am so grateful, God, for your goodness. That's the first thing Jonah does. Now here's the second thing Jonah does, and here's what you need to do when you're given a second chance, which is literally every day of your life. Number two, make my mission my top priority. Make my mission my top priority. When God gives me another chance, maybe I really messed it up, I really just blown it. But whatever God wants me to do with the rest of my life, that's what I'm gonna focus on now. After I've been given a second chance, it's not the time to keep on doing the wrong stuff. It's not the time to keep on doing what I've been doing, being selfish, thinking about me, thinking about what I want, what I need, and, and, only, and not even thinking about God in my life. No, no, this is not the time to keep living the way I want. Now I make the focus, if God's given me a second chance, if I'm still alive, he didn't put me here to continue living selfishly. He's given me another chance to live for him. He's given me another chance to make my life mission, the mission he has for my life, my top priority. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse one says this. <clears throat> Do not let the grace that you received from God be for nothing. God has shown you mercy. God has shown you grace. God has let you off the hook so many times He's forgotten sins, he's forgiven sins. God has let you off the hook so many times. Do not let the grace of God be for nothing. Like I'm just gonna abuse it, I'm gonna take it for granted, I'm gonna continue living to be a selfish clod. No, no, now I focus my mission. I focus on my life mission as my top priority. You know, the, the harder you've fallen, the more you've fallen, the more you understand gratefulness and, and actually the more you are committed to your mission. You know who Paul the apostle is in the Bible? But he wasn't always some great Christian saint. Do you know what Paul was before God got a hold of him? He was a religious terrorist. He went around killing Christians. That was his job. He traveled around the Middle East, literally murdering, killing Christians. And he thought that was his duty that he was such a zealot that uh, Christians should be all wiped out, and, and he was a religious terrorist. And one day, while he's going to the city of Damascus to kill a bunch of Christians there in Syria, he has an encounter with Jesus Christ, the risen Christ. And, and Jesus shows up on the road to Damascus, and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he goes, who are you, Lord? He goes, I'm Jesus. And he falls to his knees and he says, my Lord and my God, and he makes a 180 degree turn. And now he becomes the apostle of love. And he's given a second chance after murdering a lot of people. And here's what he says in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Paul says, I don't care about my own life, not anymore. The most important thing is that I complete my mission the work that the Lord Jesus gave me. And what was that work? To tell people the good news about God's grace, about God's mercy, about his willingness to give us another chance. Now this is the second thing that happens to Jonah. First Jonah says, I'm gonna live in a sense of profound gratitude and I'm gonna be grateful to God every day of my life for, for another chance. But in Jonah chapter three, verse one and two, it says this. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah Again, okay, here he's getting a second chance. And he says, go to that great city, 
Nineveh, and warn them of their doom as I told you. Now circle the word warn. We're gonna come back to that in a minute. It says, I want you to go to the great city of Nineveh and warn them of their doom as I told you before. Now, this is the exact same wording as in chapter one. His mission has not changed. Jonah has gone through an awful lot of problems since chapter one. He's been running from God. He's been through all kinds of problems. He's been in a shipwreck, a, a storm. He's been thrown overboard. He's been swallowed by a great fish. He's had all kinds of bad stuff happen in his life. But when he's given a second chance, God says, uh, by the way, the mission hadn't changed. It's the exact same thing I told you to do. It's what I made you to do. It's what I created you to do. It's what I decided you would do with your life before you were born. Your mission has not changed. No matter what you've been through, no matter how many problems you've had, how much stress you've gone through, how many losses you've had, how many sins you've committed, hadn't done one thing to change your life mission. What God created you for, what he designed you for, is still in full force. I want you to write this down in your outline. Circumstances may change me, but they never change my mission. Circumstances may change me, but they never change my mission. I may go through all kinds of breaking situations where I am broken financially, or I'm broken spiritually, or I'm broken emotionally, or my relationships are a mess and they're all broken, or my body is broken by a disease. I can have all kinds of circumstances, and yes, they will change me, but they never change my life mission. Everything you've gone through in life has changed you. None of it has changed the mission that God made you for before you were born. He decided that you would do. Nothing has changed that. I, I said in our last session, there is no plan B for your life. I don't care what's happened to you. There's no plan B for your life. You're still on plan A. In fact, before you were born, when God decided what he wanted you to do with your life, whether you did it or not, is your choice. And that's a big mistake to not do what you created to do. But before you were even born, he decided that he already knew all the stupid things you do, all the dumb decisions you'd make, all the sins you'd commit, all of the problems you'd face, all of the losses you'd have. He, he factored it all in. He factored it all in. Your life mission has not changed from the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb. And, and so Jonah's going, okay, I'm, I'm gonna get on track and I'm going to uh, make my mission my, my top priority. God has no plan B. You're, you're, remember this verse, I showed it to you last week. The Bible says in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, God's gifts, God gives you gifts, and his call, God has called you to do some things with your life. God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. No sin you commit can, can change God's call or God's gifts in your life. You still have the same gifts and you still have the same call in your life. Let me show it to you in the same verse in other translations. In the Living Bible, God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. He will never go back on his promises. That's why when God had a call for Moses, yeah, Moses went out and murdered a guy. It did not change his call. Here's another verse in Romans eleven twenty nine 29, in God's word translation. God never changes his mind when he gives someone gifts or when he calls someone. So it is in still full force. So I live with profound gratitude when I know I've given, been given a second chance. And, and I get on gear and I start using my life for what I was supposed to use it for in the first place. That's the second thing. Here's the third thing you do that, that Jonah did. Don't delay, obey today. Okay, don't delay, obey today. When God gives you a second chance, this is no time for procrastination. Well, I, I think I will do what God made me to do, but I, I'm gonna have a little bit more fun with my life first. I think I'm gonna do what God wants me to do, but I've gotta make a bunch of money first, or I've gotta get married first, or I gotta get through school first, or I, no, this is not a time to procrastinate on your life mission. 
When you're given a second chance, you go at it immediately. You don't delay, you obey today. It's time to get going. In verse three, Jonah chapter three, here's the third thing Jonah did. This time, now he gets the second message, go and do what I told you to do in the first place. Jonah immediately, immediately, don't delay, headed to Nineveh, it's a big city, in obedience to the word of the Lord. I bet you he ran. I think when that great fish spit him up on the beach, he probably hit the ground running. And he's probably Usain Bolt, you know, he's running all the way to, to Nineveh, which is 550 miles from the coastline of Israel. It's, it's in, in uh, where Iraq is today. It's up where, near where Mosul is in Iraq. And, uh, and he, he probably land. Would you, if God had given you a second chance like Jonah, don't you think you'd probably say, I'm gonna get with whatever God told me to do in the first place. I spent enough time going the wrong direction with my life. Now I'm gonna make up for some time. And I'm gonna go fast in the right direction. I want you to write this down on your outline. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Any parent knows this. If a dad tells his son, uh, son, I want you to go take the garbage out right now. And he says, well, I will, dad, if I get to it next week. I want you to go clean up your stuff in the garage. I, I will in a couple days. Uh, I, need you to, I need you to come help. Mom says to one of the kids, I need you to come help wash the dishes. Well, I will in two days. Delayed obedience is disobedience. When God tells you to do something, he expects you to do it now, not, not later, not to give him some excuse. So you don't delay, you obey today. What has God told you to do? And you're still dragging your feet. I mean, you know you're supposed to be doing it, but you're still dragging your feet. For instance, we know that God wants every one of us to give some part of our life in sacrificial service where we're not paid to do it, we're just helping other people out of the goodness of our heart. We're volunteering to serve, it's called your ministry. And, and, and God says, I want everybody, to, and you know that, but you're not volunteering anywhere. You're not, you're not you're, you're, all your time is based on you, is built on you. There's, there's no place where you're doing something totally unselfish for other people. You know. God says, I want you to be like me. I want you to learn to be a, a servant. I want you to learn to serve. You know God says, give the first part of your income back to me as a sign of your thanks. You don't do it. I, I know and I'm just not doing it. Some of you know God says, when you, like Jesus, when he's 30 years old as an adult, he's baptized. We're not talking about his dedication as a baby. When Jesus is 30 years old, he goes out and public as an adult makes his public profession of faith. Have you done that? Have you done that as an adult? You know Jesus said to do it, he commanded it. Be baptized, like he did. He wouldn't have done it unless he wanted you to do it. He modeled it as a 30 year old. Some of you haven't done that yet. So what is it that you're putting off that God tells you to do? You're still dragging your feet. You know, if you're a businessman, you really need to read the book of Proverbs and study it, because it has all of the principles for successful business in spades, it's an unbelievable book. You could build your business, multinational corporation, uh, on the principles uh, in God's word in the book of Proverbs. One of the principles in the book of Proverbs says, when you know something's not right, like in your business, you fix it immediately. And he says, if you've gotten into a bad financial commitment, get out of it quickly. You don't procrastinate, he says, do it now. Let me just show it to you. Here on the screen, the Bible says in Proverbs 6, Three and four. Get out of it as quickly as you possibly can. Swallow your pride. Go and humbly beg to cancel the deal. Don't put it off. Do it now and don't rest until you do. That's pretty clear. He's saying you don't procrastinate. If you made a bad financial decision, get out of it immediately. But God's not saying think about it and do it maybe in a couple years. He says, get out of it right now. Do it. And he says, if you're wise, you do it. If you don't do it, it's foolish. But a lot of times God gives us commands and we go, well, I'll think about that for a while. No, we need to don't delay, obey today. Now here's the fourth thing that uh, Jonah does. This one takes a little time to explain, but it's real important. When God gives me another chance, I'm gonna live with profound gratitude, 
I'm going to make my mission my number one priority. Uh, I'm, I'm going to not delay. I'm going to obey today. Number four, accept my responsibility to warn others. Accept my responsibility to warn others. Now, let me explain this. This is not your whole life mission, but it is part of it. It was certainly part of Jonah's life mission. And and if you are a follower of Christ, there are gonna be some times in your life when you are called on to warn some people out of love. Jonah chapter three, verse three. This time Jonah immediately headed to Nineveh in obedience to the word of the Lord. And then in Jonah, the rest of it says, now the city of Nineveh, Jonah 3, 3 and 4. Now the city of Nineveh was so big that it took three days to walk around it. But after walking a day, Jonah warned the people. Circle that word warned again. We're gonna come back to that. Jonah warned the people. Nineveh, I've told you this before, was the most powerful and the biggest city in the world at this time. Assyria is the predominant empire in the known world. And the capital of Assyria is Nineveh. It's a huge uh, city with big boulevards and temples and waters and parks and pools and uh, all kinds of uh, wide boulevards. And it was a huge, huge city. It's the biggest city in the world. And as a result, it's very prideful. And uh, he says, when Jonah gets there, it takes about three days to walk around it. That's because there were other cities around Nineveh, kind of like LA is not just one city, it's a metropolitan area of a lot of other cities. And all of those cities together would take you a long time to, to walk around. And he says, I want you to go and warn them. And it says, after a day of walking, Jonah warned the people. Now, what is a warning? Because if this is part of your life mission, then you need to know how to do a warning. A warning is cautionary advice about a danger, a trap, or a problem. That's a warning. When I give cautionary advice about a danger, or a trap, or a, a warning, or a problem. Now, God built into your body warning systems. And there are certain things that when your body uh, is not healthy, you get a fever, your blood pressure goes up. There are all kinds of signs that doctors take. There are warning signs in your body that things are out of whack. But we often don't even pay attention to our own bodies. We don't listen to what God tells us. We don't listen to what our bodies tell us. We push ourselves too far, too hard. We don't get enough sleep and on and on and on. So God has to bring people in our lives to warn us. Because we're not smart enough many times to listen to God's warning or even to listen to the warnings of our own body, our own conscience. So God has to bring people in our lives to warn us. You know, as I've traveled all around the world, I have a hobby, one of my hobbies is collecting stupid warning signs. I, I thought this might be an appropriate time to show you some of my collection. Okay, from around the world. So let me just show you a few of these. Here's one, it's a warning sign. Keep your hands out of the machinery. Look at that, that, that looks, that's almost comical. Like your fingers are getting smashed. I, I didn't, I wasn't afraid of that. I just laughed at it when I saw it because it looked like you're getting all smashed up. Here's another one. Uh, if the door does not open, do not enter. Uh, that's a very good warning, okay. Re, re, very, that's profound. Here's another one. Uh, caution, be aware that the balcony is not on the ground floor. <laughs> yeah, so if you lean over, you might fall further than you thought because the balcony is not on the ground floor. Uh, okay, that's kind of obvious. This is funny. Uh, I think I took this in Australia. It was a trampoline place. Uh, oh, no, it was in England because it's pounds. And then it says, warning, barbed wire in use. I mean, who's going to go on a trampoline that if you jump too high, you run into the barbed wire? <laughs> Somebody who hates kids, I guess. All right, here, oh, I love this one. Big scary laser. Do not look into beam with remaining eye. <laughs> okay, all right, somebody had a sense of humor. All right, big scary laser. Oh, they, I, this is in Houston. No drowning. This is on a seawall. I'm going, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll make sure that, because you told me I won't do it now. All right, no drowning. I mean, make sure. Warning, these peanuts may contain peanuts. 
or peanut byproduct. So eat at your own risk. Enjoy. <laughs> All right. I mean, really, I like this one. No trespassing. Violators will be shot. Survivors will be shot again. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're not always really smart when we get these warning signs. Here's another one. Oh, this, you've seen this on the road to Phoenix. State prison, next exit. Do not pick up hitchhikers. I passed that a hundred times when I used to go to Kay's parents in Phoenix. And so I shot that picture one day. State prison, next exit. Don't, don't pick up hitchhikers. All right, here's another one. Uh, this was in Australia, uh, these toilets. If the towel dispenser is empty, please use your clothes. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Uh, really? I, I, I just, and then I said, thank you, the management. Yeah, well, thank me, right. I'm gonna go out with, well, my clothes. Oh, this was a really good one. You may be at risk for throat cancer if, and it has three things. Number two is have a throat or mouth. Okay, so if you don't have a throat or mouth, don't worry about this. You, you will not have throat cancer if you don't have a throat or, or a mouth, all right? Now, oh, please be safe. Do not stand, sit, climb, or lean on the fences. If you fall, animals could eat you and that might make them sick, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I, I, oh, then I got this one in, in England. Touching wires causes instant death. $200 fine. <laughs> As if death is not enough. I want to scare you with the $200 fine. Okay, Newcastle. Oh, this is good. The dog, be, danger. The dog has a gun and refuses to take his medication. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, this was one of my favorite. Unattended children will be given an energy drink and taught to swear. <laughs> so, so, we have all these warning signs in the world because we're not really good at paying attention to warnings. And yet God wants us to humbly accept warnings from other people and humbly and lovingly offer them to people uh, in, in love. So, this is what, uh, uh, the fourth thing that, uh, that Jonah has to do. After walking a day into the city of Nineveh, Jonah warned the people. Now, this mission of warning, warning people uh, is a ministry of every follower of Jesus Christ. And you've probably never been taught this, okay? Uh, there, warning shows that you love God when you love, warn other people. It also shows that you love other people. If you knew that a bridge was out and I'm speeding down the country road at 50 miles an hour and you don't tell me that the bridge is out, is that loving? No. No, it's actually hateful. It means you don't love me. If you truly love me, you're gonna tell me, hey Rick, the bridge is out at the end of this road. If I walk up to the cliff and I'm about to fall off and you go, Rick, you might wanna step back a little bit. You're, you're, that's, the ground is unstable there. That's an act of love. Warning is an act of love, not an act of arrogance, not an act of hypocrisy, not an act of superiority, not an act of self-righteousness. Warning is an act of love. And, and, and God doesn't tell Jonah he doesn't say, I want you to go move into the city of Nineveh and be a good example. We'd all like that one. I, I want you to move to this wicked city and just be a good example. You don't have to say anything, just be a good example. He doesn't tell him that. Part of Jonah's life mission is, you're gonna go to the city and you're gonna warn them. You're gonna warn them. It's part of your Christian responsibility. I actually looked this up and the New Testament has over 100 examples and verses on the ministry or the responsibility of you and me warning other people that we love. Has anybody ever told you that? That that's part of your job of following Christ is to warn other people just like Jonah was told by God to warn? Uh, Paul in Acts chapter 20 verse 31 says this, for three years, I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, notice, with tears. Now why would he warn you with tears? Because he, he cares about them. You warn because you care. You warn because you love. You warn people because you, 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 you care about them. Now, 
In Jonah chapter three, verse four, second half, it says this. So Jonah warned the people, here's the warning. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Oh, that's a great positive message. In 40 days, the world, the Nineveh will be destroyed. Is this gonna be a welcome message? No. Uh, is this gonna make Jonah popular? No. Uh, is this how you attract social media friends? No. Now I want you to notice, Jonah gets this all wrong. Jonah shows no compassion at all. He doesn't have any care for the people of Nineveh. In fact, he doesn't wanna be there, we already know that. He, he hates these people, he's racially prejudiced against them, they are the enemy, he's politically on the opposite side of them, and, and he's being told to go to his political opponents and tell them and warn them about God. And he doesn't wanna warn them, and, 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 and when he goes to the city of Nineveh, he announces the, he does the minimum possible. I mean, he, he announces it in a matter of fact tone. He's, he's as brief as possible. In fact, his sermon is only seven words. Some of you would like a seven word sermon. <laughs> but he, he only has seven words. Uh, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's it. There's no compassion, there's no love. Uh, it, it, it's just, that's about the minimum you, minimum you can do. And yet God still used it. He had the wrong motivation. He had no love. Uh, and Jonah, uh, this is very, very different from the most prophets. Because most prophets, when they warned people, they give these passionate speeches. And they're, they're long and they're impassioned and they're warning and they're pleading. And Jonah just walks into the city and goes, you guys are gonna die, bye. <laughs> That's all he says. He doesn't care two bits about this nation or these people. You guys are gonna die by, while I go to the sky, you're gonna fry, <laughs> you know? And, and this is very, very different. Now, what is Jonah doing? Well, it's as if he's saying to God, there God, I did it, okay? Are you happy now? Okay, I didn't wanna do this, I didn't wanna go to these people, I don't like these people, but I told him what you said, he said the minimum, he said it with no love. He goes, there, are you happy now? He gets it all wrong, and yet still God used him. Now, why was Jonah so short and so passionless and so unloving in sharing his warning? Because he knew something that you need to know. I want you to write this down. When God gives a warning, write this down. When God gives a warning, it's a good sign. When God gives a warning, it's not a negative sign. It's a good sign because it means he wants to give you another chance. If God doesn't want to give you another chance, he doesn't give you a warning. If God gives you a warning, it means he's going to cut you some slack and give you another chance. It's a good sign. People think warnings are negative. They're actually an, a, a, an example or an illustration or an expression of love. Because you're going, I'm warning you, and so you won't go through all this pain. You won't go through all these problems. Now, I'm not gonna ask for confession or to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of you have been driving down the street or the freeway one day and you saw a red light in the back of your window, okay? And you pull over and the officer comes up and, and says, uh, may I see your driver's license? And you're nervous and, and then uh, you fumble around and trying to give an explanation why you're going 90 miles an hour or whatever, and you get this explanation, and then you hear the sweetest words when the officer said, well, today I'm just gonna give you a warning. When somebody says I'm gonna just give you, are you happy or sad? You're happy, why? Because you're not gonna be judged. You're not going to jail. You're not paying the fine. You don't get the ticket. The warning is actually good news. I'm just gonna let you off with a warning. And when God says to Jonah, I want you to go in and warn him that I'm about to destroy the city, he's saying, I really don't wanna destroy the city. If he wanted to, he wouldn't warn him. Does this make sense? 
It's a good positive thing because when you, I'm happy when I get a warning. It means I'm not going to pay the fine. I'm not gonna serve the time. I'm not gonna whatever. Because it's just a warning. Now, you need to realize that if you've had your last chance, you're not gonna get a warning. You're not gonna get any more warnings if, if you've used up your last chance. There's not gonna be any more warnings. Now the point is, let me make the point. There's gonna be times in your life when you see friends that you love or family members or coworkers that you care about and you see them about to walk off a cliff and lose everything because of a dumb decision. Part of your life mission is to warn them. To warn them. And if you don't, you don't love them. Because love warns. Now, when does God expect you to warn people that you love? When? Well, I, I went through those over 100 verses in the New Testament this week, and I made a list of all things we're supposed to warn people about. We don't have time for that. But let me just summarize it in two categories. Write these down. When am I supposed to warn people that I love? Number one, when they're not thinking wisely. And number two, when they're not acting wisely. I'm supposed to warn the people I care about when they're not thinking wisely or when they're not acting wisely. Now this is not your whole life message, but it is a part of it. Just as warning was a part of Jonah's life message. I'm supposed to warn people when they're not thinking wisely or when they're not acting wisely. Now just in case you think I'm making too big a deal about this, let me take you to another guy, another prophet named, named Ezekiel. Not the, not the football player, but here's what the Bible says about Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33, one to nine. The Lord said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, warn your people by saying this, someday, I, the Lord, may send an enemy to invade your country. And, I suppose you, and suppose you people choose someone to stand watch and sound a warning when the enemy is seen coming, okay? Now, if you ignore the warning and you're killed in battle, it'll be your own fault because you could have escaped if you just paid attention, in other words, to the warning. But suppose the person given the mission of watching and warning fails to sound the warning signal. In that case, he says, then I, the Lord, will hold that person responsible for the death of those people. Now, Ezekiel, I have appointed you to stand and warn, to stand watch and warn the people of your nation. So listen to what I say and then warn them for me. And here's what God says. When I warn people that they'll die if they keep sinning against me, you gotta warn them to turn from their sinful ways. But if you fail to warn them, then I'll hold you responsible for their death. On the other hand, if you do warn them and they ignore you, they'll die because of their sins, but you will be innocent. Wow. Now that whole passage makes me ask myself and ask you two questions. Have you ever warned anybody about anything? Spiritual. Have you ever warned anybody about a spiritual or a moral danger? Or were you more interested in being popular than helping them? Were you more afraid of their disapproval than you were in love with God and love them enough to tell them the truth, you're about to walk off a cliff. We live in a nation that is crumbling, that the culture is falling apart. And if believers in Christ don't speak up, who's gonna do it? Here's the other question. Who is God gonna hold you responsible for one day because you said nothing and let them destroy their lives? You just let them walk off the cliff and you said nothing. 
This is important. This is not your whole life mission, but it is one facet, one factor in it. Now, there's one more thing that uh, Jonah did, and this is a positive. So here's the number five, okay? If I know God's given me a second chance, and every day is a second chance, then I'm going to live my life with profound gratitude. I'm gonna focus my life on God, not myself, and, I'm, and on making my mission a priority, not everything else I was living for. I'm not gonna delay, I'm gonna to obey today, and I'm going to accept my responsibility. Sometimes I have to warn people I love because I love them. And I do it in love, and I, and I accept warnings in, in humility. Here's the fifth thing. When God gives me another chance, expect God to use me. This is good news. I expect God to use me. See, God doesn't keep you alive for you to live for yourself. He keeps you alive because he wants you to use you. God doesn't keep you alive. He doesn't give you another chance just so you can retire and do nothing. No, God keeps you alive because he has a plan and a life mission that's still in operation, whether you've done anything about it or not, up to this point. And he's saying, I want to use you. When God keeps you alive, it means God's not through with you. God is not finished with you. God has a plan. God wants to use you. you say, Rick, you don't know what I've been through. Doesn't matter. God only uses imperfect, broken people. If God only used perfect people, nothing would get done. Because there are no perfect people. God only uses ordinary, broken, imperfect people like me. I'm an ordinary, broken, imperfect person and God uses me. And God says, I'm using you as an ordinary, imperfect, broken person. See, one of the problems, a common mistake, is we turn these people into the, in the Bible into like superheroes. There are no superheroes in the Bible. They're all just ordinary people, ordinary women, ordinary men like you and me. Jonah's an ordinary guy. He doesn't wanna do what God says to do. God gives him a turnaround. He goes and does what God tells him to do. He doesn't even do it correctly, not even with the right attitude. But God still uses it. And this is, but you see, expect God to use you is the, is the fifth thing. This is why Jonah was in such a sour mood. Because he knew that God was gonna use him and he didn't wanna be used. He's going, I don't want these people to have a spiritual revival. I don't want these people to repent. I don't like these people. I'm prejudiced against them. They're not my political background. They're my enemy. And you're telling me to go and warn them, which means you don't really want to do this. And because and, if you wanted to, you wouldn't even warn them. And, and second, if you're telling me to go warn them, then you're, they're going to listen to my warning and they're going to actually get forgiven. I, that sucks. And that's why he's got this sour mood, because he doesn't want any of this. He knows what God's going to do. Now, what happens next is flat-out miracle, because the city responds to Jonah's seven-word sermon. That's all it is. Seven-word sermon. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Wow, what a sermon. And... and is the biggest spiritual revival in history. The largest city in the world turns to God. Look up here on the screen. Here's what it says. The Ninevites believed God and they humbled themselves, putting on sackcloth. What's sackcloth? It's cloth they make sacks out of, burlap, it's burlap. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least as a symbol of their humility. And when the news reached the king of Nineveh, this is the head of the Assyrian Empire. He rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with burlap, sackcloth, and even the king sat down in the dust. Then the king proclaimed a public fast. And he says, no human or animals to eat or drink anything. Let each of us and even our animals be covered with sackcloth. Then let us all pray urgently to God and let us turn from our evil ways and let us stop all our violence. Who knows? God may yet relent 
with compassion and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Folks, that is a greater miracle than a fish swallowing Jonah. The king of Assyria, the empire, and the entire city, the largest city in the world, turning to God in humility, that's a bigger miracle right there. And I want you to notice, I went through that pretty quickly, uh, five things that they did. Because these five things that they did are the pathway to personal revival and national revival. And we need both of them in our world today. Here's, here's what they did. Number one, they humbled themselves. Number two, they fasted. Okay, they proclaimed a public fast. Number three, they uh, prayed urgently. Okay, they prayed urgently. Okay, number four, they turned from evil and, and the, the bad things they were doing. And number five, they said, let's stop all violence. Would that change our society if we did those things? Hello? I mean, just, just imagine, um, for 50 years, Nineveh has been the world's largest city. They're so proud then why in the world did they respond to a seven word sermon and everybody turns to God instantly? That's an incredible miracle. Uh, why, did, why were they so receptive even though Jonah's message was unloving and short? Because God had prepared their heart. And how had God prepared their heart? The way he prepares every heart, through pain, through pain. Now, you wouldn't know this, but the largest city in the world turns to God because they'd had pain in just the few years before that. You have to know a little bit about archeology span and ancient history to know this. So let me read this to you. You see, when this happens, when Jonah's going there, the Assyrian Empire had been dominant for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's like the British Empire, the Roman Empire, the American Empire, okay. But now they're in decline, and the empire's in decline, and they're losing battles against the Medes and the Persians, which is Iraq and Iran. And they, they had domestic riots inside the city going on at this time. In 765 BC, they had a seven-year famine. This is right when Jonah is in the time. 765, that began a seven year famine. 763 BC, there was a total eclipse of the sun. We actually even know it was on June 15th. And that scared the entire ancient world because they weren't, that was like a prophecy of like doom is coming. In 762, Nineveh had a massive earthquake. It sits on a fault and they had a massive earthquake in the city. In 761, the Tigris River, which is right by Nineveh, flooded the city. So they've had total eclipse, floods, uh, enemies, riots, fires, uh, earthquakes. These disasters happen right before Jonah has arrived. God is preparing their hearts. And Jonah 3.10 says this. When God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways. He had compassion, duh, that's what he wanted to do. And he did not do what he had warned he would do. Because of this revival, the Assyrian Empire's demise, the destruction of the Assyrian Empire was postponed 100 years. And Nineveh was not destroyed until about 612 AD by the Medes and the Persians. It went for another 100 years. Does this remind you of a culture that's been dominant, seems to be decaying, and if they had a revival, God might give them another 100 years? Nineveh finally fell in 612 AD. This, this revival where an entire city comes to God was so famous in the ancient world I mean, everybody knew this. This is not just in the Bible. Everybody knew this story of Jonah and Nineveh. In fact, 1,200 years later, Muhammad tells the story of Jonah and the revival in Nineveh and writes it in the Quran, the, the Muslim book. He didn't know that. The story of Jonah and, and, the, and the fish and the revival in Nineveh, it's not just in the Bible, it's in the Quran. 
Because everybody in the ancient world knew this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Nothing had ever happened like it. He was just an ordinary guy who says, okay, I'll do it. And he didn't even do it very well. What would happen if a city like LA or Berlin or Buenos Aires or Manila or Hong Kong did the five things that the people in Nineveh did? We'd have revival. We, we, we would have revival. In this story, both Jonah and the entire city get a second chance. Now, the fact that you're still alive, let's get back to you. The fact that you're still alive means God is still giving you a second chance. Okay? But you have to pay attention to his warnings. You have to pay attention to his warnings and then do these five things. Last verse on the screen. Hebrews chapter three, warn each other every day. It's my job to warn you, it's your job to warn me, and it's our job to warn each other. Warn each other every day, because it's still today. In other words, we don't know about tomorrow, but we're still here today, so we're gonna warn each other today. We can't work on tomorrow, it's not here. Warn each other every day, because it's still called today. And so that your heart isn't hardened against God by the sin's deceit. We will share in all that belongs to Christ. That's good news, if we hold firmly till the end. So, if you hear God's voice today, listen, and don't be stubborn. So listen, I want you to listen to me, because I love you. If you wake up tomorrow morning, which I assume you will, but it's just an assumption, if you wake up tomorrow morning, you realize that every new day is another chance that God has given you. And you need to do these five things that Jonah did. Start thanking God at the beginning of the day. Thank you, God, for another day. I'm breathing, I'm alive, I have a pulse. You've given me air. Thank God every day, start living your life with profound gratitude. Number two, make your life mission the top priority of your life. Not making money, not anything else. Number three, don't delay, obey today. Whatever you've been putting off, stop it. Number four, accept your responsibility to warn other people that you love when you need to. Don't let them just walk off the cliff. And number five, expect God to use you because that's why you're still here. Let's bow our heads. Father, I wanna thank you that your mercy is new every day because we all need second chances, I sure do. Help us to remember that every moment of our lives is another chance from you. Help us not to waste it. Help us to humbly accept warnings from other people who love us and help us to love other people enough and care about them to lovingly warn them. Father, every one of us have had that stubborn pride, but we can all hear you clearly right now. So we're saying we wanna be the kind of people that you want us to be. Now you pray, God, help me to be more grateful to live with an attitude of gratitude, profound gratitude for each new day that you give me a chance. I wanna make my life mission your top priority and the stuff I've been delaying on, I'm not gonna postpone it, procrastinate anymore. Help me to care and love people more than I love their approval. And when I need to warn somebody in love, give me the courage to do that because I don't want their life on my responsibility. And most of all, Lord, help me to expect you to use me because that's why I'm here. I'm not here to live for me, but for you. Jesus Christ, I want you to be the manager of my life from here on out. And I wanna follow you. In your name I pray, amen.